Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Jamie Mulholland, and in this episode of Permutation Puzzles, we're going to look at how to build puzzle moves using commutators. If you've ever managed to get down to the final stages of a puzzle like the cube, you've only got a few pieces out of place and you need to find a move sequence that gets those few pieces into place while leaving everything else in its original position. Well, the problem is, as soon as you start twisting faces, you oftentimes end with a jumbled mess. So at this stage, luck isn't going to help us anymore. We're going to need some tools to help us build move sequences that only move a few pieces at a time. Part of the problem lies in the fact that puzzle moves are not necessarily commutative. So for example, on the cube, if you do a right move followed by an up move, that's different than doing the up move followed by the right move. So order in which you apply these move sequences matters. Ah, but luckily, mathematicians have a tool that can help us deal with non-commutative operations. This tool is known as a commutator, and it's going to help us solve these puzzles. If you want to be able to solve puzzles like the Rubik's Cube without having to memorize a bunch of move sequences, some of which you may not understand, or you want to be able to build your own puzzle moves to solve the variety of other permutation puzzles there are out there, then we're going to provide you with those basic tools. Now, we're not interested in speed solving. What we are interested in is understanding these puzzles, that is, figuring out what's possible to do on them, what's impossible, and why. So the techniques we discuss aren't necessarily going to make you a faster solver, but hopefully they'll make you a more knowledgeable one. So what exactly are commutators and what business do they have even coming up in solving these permutation puzzles? We're about to find out. I just want to return to that end game phase I was just on. I have three corner pieces that are out of place. This corner piece, the white, red, blue one, needs to go up here. This corner piece needs to go over here. And this one needs to come down here. So I need to cycle these three corner pieces in this direction. And I want to come up with a move sequence that just does that cycling and leaves everything else in its place. So here's a move sequence we can apply. It's L, D inverse, L inverse. I'll mix that in with a U move. And then I'll do an L, D, L inverse, and follow that by the U inverse move. And there we go. We've got the puzzle solved. Now, of course, the point wasn't to just apply some move sequence we memorized to solve the puzzle. I actually want to focus on how can we actually build the move sequence that does that corner three cycle. And in fact, how can we build move sequences to achieve any possible movement of pieces on the puzzle? The move sequence you just performed to do a three cycle on the corners had the form of do a move, that which was the L, D inverse, L inverse, do another move, which was the up move, undo the first move we did, which was then L, D, L inverse, and then undo the second move we did, which was up inverse. This is an example of a commutator. In general, a commutator is a move sequence of the form, do a move, do another move, undo the first move you did, undo the second move you did. We usually denote the commutator of two moves using a square bracket notation, which is just a nice shorthand. The reason move sequences of this form are so useful in solving permutation puzzles is that they allow us to control exactly which pieces on the puzzle get moved, and they allow us to build useful puzzle moves that only move a few pieces at a time. I just want to take a closer look at that corner three cycle we were able to perform. Now here's the key. I want to move only these three pieces. So the first thing I'm going to do is bring this piece into that position. So this is the key position to focus our attention on. I bring one of the pieces I want to affect into that position. And I've done it in such a way that I've affected no other position in the up layer. This makes it perfect for combining with the up move. I've only done a move that brought one new piece into the up layer, into this position. If I do an up move now, the only position that I have in common with the move I just did is this corner piece. What does the up layer bring into it? It brought this piece. So my first move brought this piece into that position. My next move is going to bring this piece into that position. And between those two move sequences, this is the only position that's affected by both of them. So we'll do our up layer. It brought the other piece I want to interact with into that position. Now if I undo the first move, it's going to send this piece down here. 
and leave everything else in the up layer untouched. That's the key. It's going to leave everything else up here untouched and it'll just send this piece down here. And now when I undo the up move, it's going to bring everything home. And so I'm just starting to focus your attention on what are the positions we need to keep in mind while we're doing those moves. There was the key position. It seemed to be the one that was affected by both the move sequences, the LD inverse L and the up sequence. What did the LD inverse L bring to that position? It brought that one there. What did the up move bring to that, this position? It brought that one there. And those seem to be the only three that were affected. The position that was in common to both move sequences and what each move sequence brought into that common position. I want to come back to that example of a corner three cycle and just make it a little bit more general, applicable to any puzzle. So I've said that a commutator allows us to control exactly which pieces on the puzzle get moved. Well, how does it do this? This is what I want to make explicit now. So in order to do this, we need a little bit of terminology. Uh, so let's imagine we have a move sequence alpha and a position. And consider the piece that's in that position. If that piece begins in this position, perhaps it moves around under the move sequence alpha, but then ends up back in the same position after the move sequence alpha is completed, then we call that position a fixed position of alpha. And the set of all positions where the piece begins and ends in the same position is known as the fixed set of the move sequence alpha. Now, this is as opposed to a piece in a position where the piece moves out of the position and never comes back after the move sequence alpha. In that case, we would call that position a moved position. And the set of all positions which are moved under the move sequence alpha is called the moved set of alpha. So we've got a, the fixed positions where the pieces end up in the same position for which they began, and the moved set, which is the positions where the pieces have moved out of those positions. The key as to why commutators are so useful in solving puzzles is that we can understand their move sets quite easily. So suppose you have a move alpha and a move beta, and they move a bunch of pieces, so the, they affect a bunch of positions. Consider the positions that both alpha and beta affect. So this is the intersection of their move sets then those are the positions that are probably going to be affected by the commutator, but there is a little bit more. There's going to be the positions that alpha moves the pieces into the intersection, and the positions where beta moves those pieces into the intersection. And those three sets are really all that gets affected in a commutator. So the common positions that alpha and beta both affect, but also the positions where the pieces get moved into that intersection by either alpha or beta. And that's it. So let's have a look at a number of examples to make this a, a little more concrete. So let's build some moves on the Rubik's Cube. Uh, I want to come back to that corner three cycle. I know it's a bit of overkill now, but we've got this new terminology in terms of intersections and move sets. So it would be nice to see that corner three cycle in terms of those ideas. So here was our first move for that corner three cycle. L, D inverse, L inverse. What it did was it brought the piece in this position into that corner. That was going to be our intersection because the next move we do is up. And so this is our intersection position of the two moves. What the up move brings into the intersection is the piece in this position. As I said, the first move brought the piece in this position into the intersection. So we've got intersection and the two pieces in these positions get moved into the intersection. So it should only affect these three pieces here. And of course, when we do it, there's no surprises that those are exactly the three pieces that are affected. So let's modify that a little bit. Instead, we're going to take the commutator of the same first move with an up squared move as our second move. So before we do that, let's predict what's going to happen. Again, we're using an up move, in this case an up squared move, so this is going to be our position which is the intersection of both the moves. The first move brought this, the piece from this position into the intersection. What's the up squared move bringing into this position? 
it's bringing the piece from this position over here. So we know that at most, the commutator will affect this position and these two positions. So let's derive. And just as predicted, we have now a move sequence that affects these three corner positions. Okay, let's try another two moves. I'm gonna look at the middle slice move and the up squared move and take the commutator of those two. Now the intersection of the middle slice move and the up squared move consists of these two positions. The up squared move doesn't bring anything new into those positions, it just swaps these two pieces. The slice move brings the piece from this position into the intersection. So immediately we know that the commutator is going to affect at most these three positions. And so let's try it. And there we go. We've got this piece moved back here, this piece moved forward, and this piece moved down. So we've got a commutator now that allows us to cycle these three edges. As a final example, let's do something a little bit different. Let's try to come up with a move that twists two corner pieces. So the first thing I'm going to do is try to come up with a move sequence that twists only one corner piece and leaves everything else in the up layer unaffected. That will set me up to allow a commutator with the up layer. So I'm going to first twist this piece. Let's try that. We'll send it down using one side and I'm actually going to then bring it back up using the other side. So I'm going to send it down and I'm going to hide it in the back corner, bring that layer back up. Now I'm going to use the front face to pick that piece back up with. And we've now twisted this corner piece in the clockwise direction. So if I take the commutator now with the up move, well the first move didn't bring anything new into this intersection. The piece that started there ended there. So that's perfect because when I do the commutator with the up move, there's only one new piece that gets moved into that intersection. So my commutator is only going to affect these two pieces. This one got rotated clockwise. When I move this one here and unrotate it, it'll rotate it counterclockwise and restore everything in the down layer. So let's do that. We'll do our up move and now we'll undo the first move we did. And then that effectively twisted that one, restored the bottom layer. Now undo the second move we did, and there's our double corner twist. Not bad. We now have a move that allows us to twist any two corners in pairs. Well, two adjacent corners, but you can try modifying it to see if you can twist two opposite corners. And I'll leave you to figure out how to twist two opposite corners with just the extra hint of the up move that we took the commutator with brought this piece into the intersection. Say we didn't want to affect this piece. Say we wanted to affect that one. Should we have taken an up move or could we have done something different? And I'll leave that with you. So I hope that gave you enough motivation now and uh, some insight into how you can actually start building your own puzzle moves using commutators. Uh, I hope you're inspired and, and now uh, get to work trying to figure these things out and building your own moves and have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, in the next part of this episode, we're going to look at a number of other puzzles, like the Mega Minx and the Pyraminx and the Skew, and we'll just look at building some moves on these puzzles as well. Uh, and then in the third part of this episode, I'm going to come back to the idea of how a commutator affects the intersection and the pieces moved into the intersection, and make that a little bit more rigorous and, and talk a little bit about permutation theory and how it's applied to analyzing these puzzles and commutators. All right, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.